Good evening, everyone. I'm Gray Mining, Slate Purdue of Broadcast News with your early evening news cap. Some breaking news last evening. The Biden administration is developing a plan to require nearly all foreign visitors to the United States to be fully vaccinated against COVID-19. It's part of a move to eventually lift travel restrictions that bar much of the world from entering the United States, a White House official told Reuters on Wednesday. Upgrades to the city of Hamilton's wastewater infrastructure will have major environmental benefits, it was announced today. Two fine mesh screening machines at the Front Street Wastewater Treatment Plant will remove approximately 40% of suspended solids from the city's wastewater. That's roughly 1,210 liters of solids enough to fill a dumpster that boosts the volume and harmful macro and microplastics entering the ocean at the South Shore outfall and see fewer grease balls washing up on the South Shore. City Engineer Patrick Cooper said a community sewer system discharging to the ocean off the South Shore has serviced the area for over 100 years. There have been previous upgrades, notably in 2015, when the filtering system was improved partly to tackle the grease ball problem. Mr. Cooper said that the city's fat spoils and the grease policy from 2014, which requires businesses to properly dispose of their waste, had made a big difference. <coughs> the city collects about five tons of waste cooking oil per week. And some positive entertainment news for you this afternoon. News of Mogul and fellow islander Rihanna is officially a billionaire. The news hitting headlines this week. Forbes reported that the Barbadian singer's multiple business ventures has seen her amass a $1.7 billion fortune, the bulk of which comes from her Fenty Beauty Supply. Thousands of fans and followers on social media applauded the star who came from humble beginnings in Barbados. And that's your early evening newscast. I'm Greg Miners with Bermuda Broadcasting News. All right, let's check out the weather right now. Partly cloudy skies for tonight, 78 degrees for the low. Chicken and half for Friday, becoming mostly sunny skies, a chance of an afternoon shower as well. Winds out of the east to southeast, moderate winds for Friday, high around 85 degrees, a low at 79. For the weekend on Saturday, bright and sunny to start with, east to southeasterly winds with a high 85 degrees, a low at 78. Checking out for Sunday, early clouds. It'll be fading towards our evening, though. High 86 to low 77. And for Monday next week, 84 for the high, a low at 79 degrees here in Bermuda. The weather service. <laughs> And it's time now for a motion to adjourn with host MP Chris Famous and Dwayne Robinson. And good afternoon. Welcome to the post cop match, post emancipation, post Mary Prince Day, post St. George's loss. <laughs> I had to do that one here. I know. I know. I know. Well, we, was, we could have left that till somebody actually showed up. Where is he too? I don't see it is not here. It's not here. Is he coming? It's not here. Uh, well, anyway, folks, welcome to another. Special edition of uh, motion to adjourn. This is our today, as we, as we have committed to do in our show, is to broaden our audience and broaden our topic. And this is our monthly territories talk where we have um, persons calling us what's going on in those territories so we can see the similarities 
of all the territories and show that we are one people. So today's guest, we have one guest from the British Virgin Islands, or commonly known as the Virgin Islands, or VI. And then we have another guest from the Cayman Islands, commonly known as CI. So without further ado, I will allow the guests to introduce themselves because I most likely will mess up the introduction. So initially we'll have the lady from the Virgin Islands. Good day. Good afternoon, Chris and Eden. Hi. I am Shana Smith Archer, for those who don't know me. Um, so happy to be here. Really excited about this. Um, and daughter of the soil in the Virgin Islands. Yes, Virgin Islands is our official yes, name. Is <laughs> so that's awesome. Okay. But um, yeah, I am happy to look forward to you know the conversation that we have today. We got a long lineup of topics. And but you know I'm gonna give our perspective on things here and and how I think we we all need to collaborate more and work together and have more conversations like this. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And um, I also must add, I'll, I'll get to you later on, but there's a little touch of nepotism in, involved, and I'll get to that in a minute. <laughs> and I also must add a guest who uh, who is not a stranger to calling in this show because he has called in before, and our good friend, and you are? Hi, Chris, I'm Eden Hurlston. Hello, everybody, good afternoon. And I'm uh, coming from Cayman Islands up in Old Rock, West Bay. That's the Republic of West Bay. That's right, that's right, okay. best way, baby. <laughs> All right, and I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a rascal. So when you say rascal, you have to put it in context because some people in different islands may interpret rascal as something that's not positive. Um, well, we so, are realists, but people get confused when we use the word realist. So I like to say that uh, we relentlessly advocate solutions, community, mm -hmm. and love rascals. Ah. Like, yes, so that's okay. that's what we do. We 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 stay up at night caring and get up in the morning and put in the work to try to make future generations have a better time. <laughs> all right. So we all do, we're also doing something new today. Um, we are streaming via the graces of Miss is Mistress Miss is Shana <laughs> Smith Archer. She has set us up on StreamYard, so we are broadcasting not only on the radio in Bermuda, but the radio in uh, the Virgin Islands, and also over Facebook. So folks in Cayman Islands and Virgin Islands and Bermuda Islands can actually be part of the conversation. Log on to my page if you're into Bermuda. If you're in Bermuda, log on to Shana's page if, if you're in a vi vigilant, vi how do you pronounce it properly? Vigilati Dialogues. Vigilati Dialogues, Dialogues in, in the Virgin Islands and Eden's page if you are in the Cayman Islands. Because we are, we are looking to broaden our horizons. So, topping our list, we have, this is the Olympics. Five years in the making. And for all of our territories, this has been a fabulous Olympics. And we'll get to what, what happened for Bermuda, but we'll start off with, with you, Eden. What, what has happened for your um, athletes that competed in the, in the Olympics? Well, we had uh, um, some good showings. Make, here we go. Um, I had my mic mute on the stream yard there. Oh, I got to get used to this stuff. <laughs> But, uh, and, and we're very proud of our athletes. Um, I think we could have a lot more support for them. We don't even have an Olympic sized pool, for instance, for training. Um, but uh, really, you know, uh, the whole country is very proud of them. Some of us are, are confused about the Olympics happening at all while the pandemic is still going on and the, the lack of uh, vaccinations being mandatory for the athletes and things like that. But, um, 
you know, it's it's uh, it's a it's a good thing to bring the world together and and that we can all focus on some positive things with our athletes shine. Okay, and um, and for the Virgin Islands, tell us what happened with your happened with your athletes. Well, we had three athletes that participated. We had in swimming, uh, athletics, and uh, women's long jump. Um, uh, Chantal Malone, our athlete in the long jump, she made it actually to the finals. So she didn't make it to the podium, but we're very happy that she was able to make it there. Um, Elena Phillips, I think this was her first Olympics, and she was in the swimming, the 50 meter freestyle. Wow. Did did well in her heat, and we're well, happy that she even made a show in. So, but our pride and joy, I would say, of the moment is um, Kyron McMaster, who ran in the 400 meter men's um, hurdles, and he came in fourth. But then now he's in the there was a, a wall record broken. So now in terms of his time, he's you know right up there with the best of the best. Right up there with the best of the best. So, you know, we were mm -hmm. even with joy over, over that moment. Because, again, any, any accomplishment just to even make it to the Olympics, it's, it's a very a big accomplishment. So, you know, I don't want people to understate it. Sometimes because people don't make it to the podium, they kind of discount it. But there's a lot of effort that goes in behind the scenes leading up to, you know, those couple seconds on the track or, you know, the time in the pool or, or jumping on the, the pit. So, you know, we want to congratulate them again. You know, people have been sending out shout outs on Facebook all week. <laughs> you know, recognizing them. So that's a great thing. Yeah. Um, and for us in Bermuda, we haven't had our show done. Oh, uh, sorry. I made my apologies. Let me introduce my co host, the engineer, Mr. Don Bassett. He won't be on camera because of situation here, but he is on the air. So, yeah, they should. You, you hear Don? You guys are hearing yeah, Don? Yeah, Hello. Okay. Um, so, Don, tell us what happened with our, our, we had two or three athletes. I think in, we didn't have, we didn't have a big con contingent this year, but tell us what happened with two of our athletes. I know you want to go ahead. Right. So what what we have to be proud of as overseas territories is that our populations, in example, in the Virgin Islands, your population is thirty thousand. In Cayman Islands, is sixty sixty or thousand. In Bermuda, sixty or thousand. But we, we all have had athletes that have competed in it, not just made it to the Olympics, but made it to the finals, right? Fourth, beating out countries that there have mil there are millions of persons. If you look at Miss um, Malone, she she didn't she didn't medal, but she made it to the finals where countries with millions of people who did not make it to the finals. And if you look at um, even the the young lady. Lady Miss um, Gray, I want to say, conscious for millions of people did not make it. And, mm -hmm. and yeah, sorry, Ray. I knew, I knew it was something to do with liquor. Ray. Ray is a nephew. Um, you have, uh, for us in Bermuda, you have Miss um, Flora Duffy from an island of 65,000, less than 65,000 persons. She literally beat the breath, as we say, Bermuda, beat the breath out of somebody from England and America. <laughs> so we have a lot to be proud of as small islands that we are producing athletes or athletes are producing the results that they are doing. And even if they didn't matter, they are our heroes. Floor, mm -hmm. um, this was her third or fourth, uh, which was, she came eighth one year. She didn't finish one year. It's been a, a host of issues, but she she was persistent. 
So if if um, if Ms. Malone and Mr. McMaster and the Ms. Philip persons in mm -hmm. um, Cayman Islands, Ms. Ray mm -hmm. and others, if they mm -hmm. they be persistent, we, yep. we will Reagan, we Reagan will ready. get on that podium. And what I what I love most, he wasn't doing it just for herself. Right. She wasn't doing it just for herself. She was doing it. She wasn't doing it just for Bermuda. She, she was doing it for the whole Caribbean. Right? She mm -hmm. considers herself as part of the Caribbean. So we all have to, you know, applaud, applaud not and from the Caribbean region at large because Jamaica is just <laughs> so, mm -hmm. you know. So Jamaica did us all proud. That's for sure. That, what that do we have sure. next to talk about? Oh yeah. And I, I think that this is a, this is a good. It's a good thing about uh, gaining a regional, some regional unity. You know what I yeah. mean? We should be cheering for each other's uh, teams, oh, yeah. and for the any of the triumphs that go on. You know, we we need to be aware of where we've come from as a people, and that we're we're only going to get someplace positive if we if we stick together. And this region has so much to be yeah, and that, to share with each other. Yeah. So the next topic we're going to talk about is we are going to talk about um, what's happening with COVID. I mean, we're looking on the news. We just heard on our local news that the U.S. is looking to make it mandatory that anyone travel to the to America has to have a vaccine or be be vaccinatedly correct term jabbed up <laughs> um, so what, what's happening with the COVID situation in your country um uh, Eden um there is uh, uh, positive news in that we are very highly vaccinated I believe we're um, it's 70, we're over 70% for both jobs for sure. And, and getting close to 70 for two jobs, but the uptake has gone, you know, uh, down quite a bit. Um, and we're trying to, we're aiming for 80% in order to activate the full tourism, uh, the reopening plan. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it's it's we're facing some difficulties in that um, we're staring down the barrel right now of mandating vaccines for work permit holders, and there are some private entities that are that are starting to exercise their own rights as far as um, you know if putting it out there that they want their employees to be vaccinated if they're going to be on the front line and service and being directly in touch with people in the public especially in moving toward reopening, holding out bonuses if uh, people aren't vaccinated, um, and limiting um, access to the two places as well as, as a possibility that's being talked around. Um, but, uh, and, and we see it happening in the States. In New York, they just made you know, a comprehensive policy about uh, having people requiring, you know, vaccines to get into certain venues and different things like that. And so I think that we're seeing this, we're going to be seeing this sort of thing happen. Um, I, I'm, 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 a lot of people here aren't confident about reaching 80% here. Um, I personally feel that it's important everywhere, especially for small island nations like the three of our places and the just smaller, smaller populations where one case can mean a lot. A, a, one, a rapid spread can happen because it, not because we have a lot of congestion, but because you have such a small population, um, where a few cases can mean it can leave a lot in its wake. We need to have reopening plans, plural, as in some layered approaches to doing it and making sure that things can stay safe and as manageable as po as possible. And we need to have staying closed plans, plural. So uh, we have other approaches in case. Another variant pops up, or anything happens, and we have to shut back down. That we don't have um, complete closure, and a lot of people being left out in the in the cold, so to speak, uh, and uh, try to avoid econo socioeconomic fallout that's been coming along with this health fallout. So, 
a lot of people in the tourism industry are hurting right now and don't see another option other than activating a reopening plan. Um, and it, it, there's, there's not a lot to put our teeth into right here other than saying, let's try to make it to 80%. So it's tough. I'm, I'm in an events based business where, you know, it takes people a few months to plan weddings, especially with a de doing a destination wedding or something like that. That's what I would make a lot of my income from in the in the winter seasons. Oh, that's much better. And um, and so my season is pretty much shot because if, if uh, I've had quite a few inquiries and um, clients who were you know looking to plan something here and the time just ran out and they just don't have the confidence to still stay booked uh, with us and have us provide their services and come to Cayman because. They just don't know if they're going to be able to do it. So they've either changed plans or they've gone to Turks and Caicos or they've, uh, you know, done something else. But so we're, we're just hanging on, you know, and, uh, and, and hoping for the best and hoping that people get vaccinated um, and thankful that we've been able to kind of live in this safety bubble for so long. But it, it's not easy here for people in the tourism industry, especially people like myself who are owner operators and who have been invested for years and, we can't just pivot out and go pick up a job somewhere else. And, you know, it's, it's, uh, and I have a family and, you know, so it's, it's different if you're a young person, you're serving tables and you can go do this and do that and swing around. But, uh, you know, it's, uh, it, people are in different situations. And for many of us in the tourism industry, it's, it's very stressful. That's for sure. What's it, what is it like in Virgin yeah. Islands? Yes. Oh, no, Same. Zach. And, um... Oh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so, Chris, you have to mute your mic when we talk. That's where the echo is coming from. All right, great. Yeah, similar to what Eden Express, um, our economies are heavily based around tourism. And, of course, no, the pandemic, that was one of the first things that, that stopped where we close borders to prevent traffic, to get a handle around things. So, you know, over the last year and a half, it's, you know, been a gradual opening back up of borders in terms of to travel, uh, apart from nationals coming in and out, you know, in terms of coming back home, that, you know, we are allowing visitors to come in and to, to start to, to, you know, produce economic activity. So it, it has been a challenge in terms of, you know, the levers of the protocols. Sometimes we're, you know, on, sometimes we're off. And it's, it's, it's understandable because, again, this is unprecedented for everybody. So we, we're we trying to figure this out in a way. But I think a year later, we have a good sense of, you know, what we need to do. We know the public health protocols work. We, you know, we, we realize, uh, especially that when we just recently had an outbreak, you know, where we were in the thousands of cases. And that was a first for us because we hadn't experienced anything like that last year. We did have a spike last year, August actually. Um, but again, it's, it's it's all a wrong no. What, how do we stimulate the economy still within? Because the charter boats, their yachts, they're back out on the water. Is that income bracket, you know, they're already out there traveling and, you know, trying to get away and get some kind of sense of normalcy, I guess. But, you know, it's the, still the smaller villas and guest properties that are definitely looking forward to November to see what happens. But I think the key thing around, you know, what we talk about, the public health protocols, the vaccinations, um, you know, I saw the article Chris, you shared, you know, about the U.S.'s plan in terms of in the borders. But listening to the World Health Organization today, you know, there's still large inequity around the vaccination process. And it's like, this is a pandemic. It's not just in certain countries. And for us to really pull out of this, it's got to be more widespread in terms of the vaccinations, you know, whether it's within this region or even in the, the larger countries. So it's, it's going to be interesting to see what happens over the next three months, I, I think, uh, especially for us now, as, as we begin, we're trying to gradually you know encourage tourism travel and and put things back into play especially for the small businesses because like you said kid like you said Eden, it's it's the small it's the micro and the small ones that are really feeling the crunch right now without any meaningful economic activity we're seeing global um the global factors of inflation 
getting things here in terms of material and imports, it's a nightmare as a project manager. I can tell you firsthand, you know, we're, we're working on some projects and every three months we're like, we having to say, you know, we're, we're gonna add some more time to the schedule because it's, it's hard. It's, it's really hard in terms of how things have been so disrupted and still is um from an economic standpoint so vaccine um uptake again similar to you guys we have a target of 80 as the buffer 70 75 as as you know a good place to be and um making sure that we're we continue to pursue that i think we just lost chris okay hopefully he pops back in maybe he just came off camera for a second um it I, it's it's it, it, interesting that uh you know the the similarities of of what's going on even with dim, different um some different strategies being employed and like i i mean you know like for instance we've had a lot of uh small business input there's a there's a lot of input from the sector going into directly to um people making decisions uh and so we have a lot of stakeholder buy-in in the process. Um, and, and a lot of places aren't having as good of luck with that. But And yet, uh, Cayman, you know, we're not putting ourselves in a position. We're supposed to have a soft reopening September 9th. And all fingers crossed and prayers answered, October 14th, we're supposed to be reopening to some visitors. Now, we have had some movies and shows filming here and things like that. So... Mm -hmm. um, I feel like a, quite a while ago we could have kind of started widening from that circle as a strategy and still been kept um, safe, been, stayed pretty safe by having a layered approach and multifaceted approach. Um, but we have decided to err on the side of caution, which has its um, benefits for sure, and especially in in, in addressing the health the the health emergency that it, that is COVID. But the socioeconomic fallout really isn't getting addressed. There's not a lot of comprehensive um, um, programs going on per se. And then as well, um, we, we're more dependent on, on the development dollar, which is, is wreaking havoc in, our, in, our, uh, in, in Cayman. Um, are you finding that there as well? Is it more that, like, are you seeing more dependence um, possibly to not uh, to to a fault and on other industries or um, are you able to regulate that and still keep some prosperity flowing around relatively speaking um you can see the impact because again hotels they're supplied by the grocery stores you know the drink the liquors everything that that goes into what their services are so it's it's a domino effect they definitely felt it in terms of you know if Restaurants, let's say, for example, we have a curfew right now from seven o'clock. There's no in dining at the restaurants. You can take out. So it tells you, you know, def definitely there's going to be reduced business activity because then normally, even if tourists are here, they would, you know, go for, for dinner, especially. And that's where, you know, restaurants make the bulk of their money. So those types of things, even from last year, once we did, you know, open back up after the initial lockdown, that we saw definitely a reduced level of business activity and it was a knock on. So, you know, businesses definitely cried out and said definitely reduce in terms of revenue, you know, it's it's a lot less um, in terms of just relying on the domestic population. You know, we did a lot of staycation promotion last year as well, again, to try to stimulate the tourism industry and encourage people to, you know, enjoy the islands. because. For most of us, we like to go and travel, especially, you know, around your summertime or your Christmas holidays. And a lot of that was restricted this year. So that's what's happening. So what's been happening in Bermuda, Chris? See, I have to unmute your mic, Chris.
Okay, I think they're on a news break right now. Yeah, they're, they're, there's a news break going on. Okay. Yeah, we've, um, it's been a, it's been a interesting ride this last year. Yep. <laughs> okay, let's see if he pops back up. All right, so thanks to those who are tuned in. Um, see you guys in the comments. Yeah, we're having some technical difficulties. Hopefully, Chris pops back in. But they are actually, the Bermuda station is on a news break right now. So as soon as that over, hopefully he pops back in. Yeah, thank you for um, for hosting the live stream. And I hope some, some looks like some folks are catching it on Facebook and everything. Um, I've been I've been really enjoying your page and the, your media. It's it's refreshing and enlightening and informative and I, it's fantastic. The style and it's fantastic. Real pride of the Caribbean. I'm it's, I'm I'm glad to to have found it through this connection and make this connection. Fantastic. Thank you. That's my hobby. <laughs> People think I get paid for it, but that's my hobby. <laughs> <laughs> you should be <laughs> getting paid for it. <laughs> we'll work on it in another life. <laughs> yeah. All right, Chris is back. I think the news break is still on. seconds. So Chris, we need you to unmute yeah. on Facebook. I need you to unmute on Facebook. Sorry, I, I need you to unmute. We're not hearing you on Facebook. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay, my apologies. There you go. There we go. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it always takes a minute to guide the man, right? Um. What's happening in Bermuda is that we have had, uh, I wouldn't say close our borders, right? Our borders weren't closed, right, Brother Dawn? But what we had to do was put in some stringent and, let me be frank, unpopular measures that persons coming into the island, if you are immunized, you have to take a test upon entry. Then you have to take a test on the fourth day. You have to take a test on the eighth day, and you have to take a test on the 14th day. For those who were not immunized, they had to be quarantined or, or quarantined at a local hotel. So what that meant is as soon as they came off the plane, they were tested, and then they were um, taken on via bus to a, via minibus, let me be clear. Um, to a local hotel where they had to re have to remain for 14 days. And what that had done is give a layer of protection that anyone who was um, un unimmunized was not in the general population, I guess, for lack of a better word. Um, it proved to be very unpopular because people, what it wasn't so much that you had to be quarantined, but 
the government said, hey, you're going to have to pay for this yourself. So that means persons were paying upwards of um, from $3,000 um, for the cheap hotel <laughs> and then some more money if they were staying at the high-end hotel. So, so far we have maybe three, three to 400 persons that fell in that category. Um, as of late, what's, what we've seen happening is that as of, uh, we'll say yesterday, we have maybe about 60 active cases. Um, there are one, two persons, three persons in the hospital, one person is in ICU, and 89% of those cases that are that have come up are persons who are un, un immunized, unvaccinated. So what does that tell us? Is that the Delta variant is there. The Delta variant is something we have not seen before. We have not experienced this. So even if you are immunized, you could potentially have it and potentially pass it on to others. But what's happening in America and other places in the world, those that are catching it, and, and not everyone, let's be clear, not everyone who catches it ends up in the hospital. But those that do end up in the hospital and unfortunately pass away, it's almost 90% persons who are unvaccinated. So every country is now grappling with, um, with this thing. The CDC just put out a new list today of places that they are telling Americans not to go to, particularly in the Caribbean. They're telling people not to go to St. Martin, not to go to Guadalupe, not to go to Barbados. Not to go to the to their own U.S. Virgin Islands. They're telling people not to go there because the the COVID raging. So the point the point to everyone, whether it be Bermuda, Cayman Islands, who is unopened right now, and Virgin Islands, who unfortunately are experiencing um, are experiencing a, a massive outbreak, is that. You know, as much as as much as we like to put uh, faith in natural medicines or the fact that we're surrounded by sea and salt and sunshine, that is not going to cure COVID. Not. So the challenge we have we have to look at persons, more persons getting um, immunized. In Bermuda, we are like 65, 66 percent immunized. In Cayman Islands, you're around 70%. Uh, unfortunately, in the Virgin Islands, you are, the last statistic that I got was that you're still less than 40% 40, fully immunized, hence why, unfortunately, you've seen 37 deaths. And from what I've understood, all of those deaths are persons who were not immunized. And um, there was a question that came up, can you bring it back up again? It was from someone in Cayman Islands as far as reopening. Uh, um, hello from Cayman. Can you guys speak on what you think some different opening closing scenario options may look like? Uh, <laughs> well, if people, if people in Bermuda, we are trying not to go back to a lockdown because that hurts our uh, hurts our economy. That that has killed many jobs, uh, many businesses have won't survive that. I'm sure the same in every in every country, but especially in small economies such in our such as ours that are heavily dependent on um, tourism. Um, those who work in hospitality, whether it be in hospitals, sorry, hotels, or drive taxis or so on, for over a year they have not seen any steady income. So we have to, as governments and more so as the people of these islands, have to get serious about our vaccination program. That's Unfortunately, that's the reality in which we're living. So I'll turn that over to you now, Shana, to answer this lovely latest question. Okay, I think for us here in the Virgin Islands, one of the key things that we, again, like you're saying, the, the health protocols and all of those in terms of policy have, have to be in place. One of the biggest challenges that we have, though, is, uh, you know, I was talking to Eden beforehand about the social safety nets. We don't have unemployment benefits. We don't have uh, a scheme in place that, you know, triggers, 
you know, business, a business relief. Let me put it like that. So a one-off um, program was done last year, and that was for about three months. And I think at that time, you know, we were hoping that, you know, by the by December, we would be in the clear of this thing. But, you know, as, as we've seen now, you know, every economy is in some type of recession. And with that, no, it's, it's really a, a survival mode here on the ground in the Virgin Islands. We had some challenges with government um, policies that went into play a couple months ago, raising court fees. So again, that on top of, you know, inflation measures where we're seeing the prices of goods go up, you know, as small island nations, we know that we bring in 99.9% of what we consume. So that is quite um, a hurdle, I would say, that has to be jumped right now. So it's, it's something where it's, it's behoove around in terms of businesses, especially here, to have business continuity plans. So we saw a lot of businesses, if they could work remotely, they went into remote working mode. And anytime we've had to restrict movement of persons and persons have to work from home, they do that. But then again, you know, the particular industry of tourism, no, you can't work remotely for a restaurant, you know, or car rental or, you know, even your trucking business. Because again, all of these are dependent on each other. So there's quite a bit of integration in terms of the industries across each other. Cruise ships, you know, we, we've had that beautiful pair park now basically kind of been on a hiatus for the last 18 months because, you know, we had one ship that's come so far. Um, but again, the, the type of traffic, like you said, the taxi men, they, they're not seeing that. So they've been doing some of the transportation services in terms of picking up persons that have to go from the ports of entries into quarantine. Um, and the government initially picked up the tab on that, but then it went now to the traveler. So if you're coming in, then you have to, to pay for your transportation, as usual, I would say. But um, but yeah, it's it's a matter of we seeing businesses have to get very creative because you know the assistance that would sometimes typically be there, and it's something that we are lobbying for as a business community that we do have these things because we saw the same outcome after the hurricanes in 2017, where again you know as a business you had to go into all your reserves to be able to you know build back infrastructure. Um, continue to pay the employees. And I think that's one of the biggest strains on, on businesses right now where, you know, you're trying to keep your employees paid, even if it's, you know, reduced hours or even reduced wages in some instances we heard about last year. So again, until, you know, the economic activity really ramps back up, it's it's going to put a lot of people out, out of business. That's the unfortunate reality. So yeah, you're right, Chris. In terms of looking at frontline, we have had... Um, businesses, some businesses here that are in the tourism industry that have mandated that their employees need to be vaccinated because they have to look at, you know, if I have to close because one employee may have been exposed and that means they expose the entire staff, you know, how does that work? So there are those that they've had to put their staff on shift so that if one shift does have to go out on self-isolation, then they, they're able to still continue to do business. So it's it's really a, a tough road we're traveling on right now. And um, yeah, I don't think any government wants to have to close down the economy because it's even if you're just managing off of the local population, something is better than nothing. And, and that's what a lot of businesses are saying because you still have to pay the light bills, you still have to pay the bank, you know, and, and and everybody else in terms of your creditors and suppliers. So it's it's really a really um it's really a hard time right now. So we're just hoping and praying once the current outbreak subsides and get everything under control. Um again we're hearing to the pub the protocols inclusive of the recommendation on the vaccine that you know everyone stays vigilant because I think that's one of the key things that I learned that we can't get complacent because the virus is still very much, you know, alive and well and very aggressive from what we're seeing now with these different variants. Because, you know, again, there's Delta, but today World Health Organization was talking about variant of interest, Lambda, and that is already in 40 countries. So it is it is a very um, dynamic situation that we're we're having to manage, and I, I think with the right messaging around, you know, persons understand their personal responsibility in addition to what the businesses and the government, all of us have to come together 
and um and rally and do what's necessary yeah that's it's really you touched on an important point there as far as the cost of living and the cost of doing business in general when your revenue is stressed and your personal income is might be next to nothing if you're dependent on tourism um and we're having a you know a, a ton of inflation here every um two by four you buy is four times as much every uh, um one of the uh, popular my brother was just at a popular restaurant getting takeaway last night and the, every item has gone up by one dollar and it's uh meanwhile so many people are struggling uh just to have uh you know have, make some money um but it's it's the it, to, as far as opening plans and closing scenario options, um, there's a, of course a huge movement, and I mean this is this is my wife asking this question, so she we've we've talked about it um, at length. But as far as clo closing scenarios, there is a huge movement for us to f uh, take climate action, especially in the Caribbean. We have sea level rise going on. We have um, climate change happening. We have a lot of environmental uh, um, uh, threats happening, a lot of biodiversity loss. And then what goes interlinked with that is a lot of devastation to our cultures, our, our communities, our ways of life. And I think that there, there's a lot of international funding available to be able to reinvest in that. So that would might be a way of bringing some outside capital in and getting people who are have boats, have buses, if you're taking scientists around to do stuff or taking people around to plant trees or taking people to investigate corals and see what's going on with them or, or plant mangroves, or then you can still be working. And so it, it, it's a way to, to pivot people who have transportation-based tourism industries into doing another activity that's just that's going to be of benefit to the entire country. Um, and it can still even work as far as doing reopening plans. Because, I mean, one of the obvious things, like I said, about widening the circle, for us, we haven't really had reopening, but we have had um, select, highly selective visitation going on. So movie crews, television crews, um, different scientific endeavors that have been happening. I think we should expand the circle on those, maybe even go to one-on-one um, -on -one sports, stand-up paddle boarding and, and different things like that, to where you can gets these easy, these more controllable uh, people coming in who are, if you're part of a team or part of an organization, it's much easier to make sure everyone is vaxxed, much, sure, much easier to make sure where everyone is staying. And so again, if people are are able to work those type of things and where we're, it's not just the gates are flung wide open and anyone and everyone can come in, but you have a lot of control over the visiting that's going on, then I think that that's one way to look at opening and that can work side by side still with pursuing um, climate action and trying to involve people in the tourism industry to get involved in that, especially if they have charter businesses, because the charter business owners here are a lot of the people who are are really in tight spots. They have hundreds of thousands of dollars invested into boats and buses and different things, and they're just not running. And the worst thing in the world for those things is to not run. And someone who has all that equity put in can't just pivot and be like, okay, I'm just going to be a construction worker now, or I'm just going to be, you know, it's 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 not that simple and clear cut a thing. You don't just go for job training and come out of a 30 year long career that you have a half a million dollars invested into. And so, and um, alongside with that is that is we are so dependent on development now, it's really working at a disadvantage to us because the, the fees that are coming from development and the fees that are coming from, from um, selling properties um, to people who are investing from overseas, sight unseen, people are buying property in Cayman without ever having visited here and developing on it. And it's driving up the cost of living and the cost of property. We're pricing ourselves right out of the property market. And so this is going to have far reaching two generations long effects because we aren't, um, aren't uh, we're, we're so dependent on it right now and we're not reopening to the tourist dollar or finding creative ways to go about bringing other revenue in and shoring up the other pillars of our economy. So it, it really is a, a situation with a lot of intricacy to it. And I think um, in, in nations like we're talking about, like ours, with, such, with small populations where a few cases means it can mean a lot of damage, um, 
we we have to think in multi in at multiple levels and think of layered approaches and there is no cure there is no getting rid of this there is going to be other situations like this that come across the world like you say the lambda variant is just being is being discussed now and this thing is slow evolving so it could mutate again in a few months time and we have to be prepared to deal with that so we can't just make a plan that's saying okay this is how we reopen and get everything back to normal I don't. I, I think we're literally in the realm of a different kind of normal. We really have to think more creatively about how we are going to ensure well-being and and welfare for everyone involved, not just those who can weather the storm easily because they're financially insulated from the situation. And I think that that's what's happening. Is some disparity going on here? You know. Sorry, we're gonna go to a question that came in from the BVI from Mr. Carl Dawson. He asks, have and I want Brother Dawn to answer this one, have affected groups such as taxi associations, hotel workers, we're present advocated to have, sorry, hotel workers unions advocated to have persons take vaccines given that they are greatly impacted. And Brother Dawn, I want you to come in on that answer. Well, right now, there's there's no there's no um, you know we don't have to it's not mandatory that we take a, you know mm -hmm. a vaccine. Um, it's just up to the individual cab driver if he wants to be vaccinated or not. Otherwise, than that it's not uh, it's not mandatory. Because one of thank you bro, thank you brother Don. One of the things that happened here in Bermuda is that the hotel association they've never come out and said okay all hotel workers should be vaccinated. But what they have said is that as an association, that those who are not vaccinated should be subject to weekly tests. Now, the challenge therein is that what your medical, what your medical basis is, is supposed to be um, a confidential, right? Whether I'm vaccinated or not, my boss should not know this. If I choose to say, hey, I'm vaccinated, that's my business. If I choose to say, hey, I'm not going to get vaccinated, that's my business. That's privacy. So the question that the ethical question that came up was, how would a boss, how would employers know who's vaccinated from who isn't vaccinated, number one? And number two, how can you force people to legally force people to take a test every week? Because that's now becomes um a form of a di di dictation i guess you would say so what has happened in bermuda is actually that the the union that represents hotel workers is called the bermuda industrial union they actually came out strongly against the employers saying that that's a violation of workers rights that they are the unvaccinated are being forced to take um, these weekly tests based on the grounds that employers not supposed to know your, your status anyway. Um, I know in Cayman Islands that, and correct me if I'm wrong, there is no union for hotel workers, correct? And in the Virgin Islands, there is no union for hotel workers, correct? No, we only have a hotel association. That's part of the chamber of So from what I've seen in the Virgin Islands, I can't speak to the Cayman Islands, but what I've seen in the Virgin Islands, it started in uh, Oil Knot Bay, if I'm not if I'm mistaken, in Virgin Gorda, where um, the employers were saying that if you're not vaccinated, you're going to have to take a weekly test, or you're going to have to stay home from work, or some something or the other, and people were crying for the government to to step in. From what I've seen, the government has said employers have a right to demand certain things. So. The challenge, especially in the hospitality industry, is, is almost like is almost like a damned if you're doing it, damned if you don't. For those who want to work, you need tourists coming in. Tourists are only going to come in into a country that they feel safe. The only way for the country to be safe, right? Let's meet, let's be real. The only way yeah. for the country to be safe from COVID is to have a high percentage of persons immunized. 
and especially those who are in contact with guests who are coming in every every day, right? Mm -hmm. So those who work in the hospitality industry, the reality is that unfortunately, you know, you can't say, well, on one hand, you can't say, oh, I don't want to get immunized. This, this is my rights because the, your, your individual rights are going to result in that your hospitality industries are going to be stifled. So, mm -hmm. you know, that's, that's, that's the reality in which we're living. So that's the situation in Bermuda. Um, and Eden, you can answer for what's happening in Cayman Islands as far as uh, hospitality workers. Well, I, I think a lot of people in the, in, in the tourism industry are vaccinated. Um, it, it we have a pretty high percentage within the sector. Um, there are still a good amount of people who aren't. And I personally don't think that uh, Caymanians within their own country should be forced to, but I do see the wisdom in having work permit uh, holders vaccinated. And if for no other reason, for the simple reason that we do not know what travel is going to be like in the future, and if they ever have to be re repatriated for any reason, even if it's a family emergency, they need to be know that they can travel. Also, it shouldn't be that um, that a foreign worker who has a choice to work here or not slows up the process of our tourism industry reopening when the people who own and invest in tourism businesses here are here. We're, we're in Cayman, right? We, we don't have a choice to just say, oh, I'm going to go to America or go to Canada or go to England or go to wherever. Um, so I, I, it's not fair for the rights of Caymanian um, tourism business owners to be compromised by um, what is an unsound medical decision. And in short, to me, we're at war. And the, West, the best weapon we have at our disposal is a vaccine. Um, people who personally don't want to take up that weapon, that I understand that. If you have uh, concerns, unfortunately, legitimate concerns are being crowded in with um, you know, myths that people pick up from the latest WhatsApp forward and things like that. So you have a lot of disinformation that's unfortunately confusing the real legitimate questions of people who have vaccine concerns are asking. And that's unfortunate and that's a disservice to the discussion as a whole. But um, I, I, um, it, it, I don't feel like there should, there should be a need for, for mandates if we have a wise approach to it, if we have um, ensure that people have the right information about the vaccine or having real discussions about it and getting real information on it. Um, but I do, I do see the, the need for mandating it among healthcare workers, among, and again, it, we're at war. Certain liberties are going to be t taken aback and regulated and, cons and constrained. That's how it was when we were locked down for weeks and weeks and weeks and, and we couldn't go anywhere and I had to walk my dog at a certain time of day and I could only go to the grocery store on the H days and all, all of that type of thing. And we all weathered that together. Right now I need to go and register for our employment opportunity place that's already bogged down because they're saying I need to do that in order to get my assistance for my tourism, uh, for being a, a displaced tourism worker. It makes no sense to me because I'm a business owner. Why am I, 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 so? But I'm going to go and do this thing because I'm being asked to do that by my government because that's what they feel is the next thing to do. And we, we all need to make sacrifices. So I think that as long as people are willing to accept the responsibility of them in this crazy, scary time full of crazy, scary decisions and choices we have to make, that if you're not vaccinated, you may not be able to get into a restaurant. You may not be able to get work at a place where you thought you might be able to get work. If you choose to go and get trained to be in the tourism industry, you may need to get vaccinated in order to be on the front lines and in order to be a bartender or serve a table at a restaurant or be a, you know, be a work at reception at a hotel. Um, and these are the type of things that we have to accept. So I hope that people are accepting the emergency situation that we are in and like all adults have to are willing to deal with the benefits and consequences of our decisions as they come you know if uh, if i've been vaccinated since i was first ever able to it didn't matter what my personal decision or choice was on it 
even though I'm, I, I did the research and I was satisfied with, with, with what I felt was I needed to know in regards of vaccine safety. But my, my, I have a close family member. My mother is, is at risk. And I shared households with her when during the lockdown and stuff. So we had to be very, very careful. And as soon as the vaccine came out, we went and got it because uh, that's one thing that's not going to happen is I'm not going to be responsible for my mother catching <laughs> COVID. You know what I mean? And and the, and and I work in the tourism industry, so it was that uh, that whole other thing. Plus, I have a child who's under the approved vaccination age, so I have all those things to juggle. That it it doesn't matter what my personal opinion is on the matter of the vaccine. I have to do that at a responsibility, out of a greater responsibility for my community, for my son, and for my family. And I I hope that people are seeing that the same way. And if they make the personal decision to not get vaccinated, that they are okay with dealing with the limitations and regulations that are almost certainly going to be coming because we are seeing it happening. And I can't imagine that some hotel or some restaurant wants to be ground zero for the next, for the first time community outbreak happens in Cayman since last year. After we've come this way, no, no resort is going to want to say, oh, well, we're just going to play it by ear. You know what I mean? Nobody wants that headline. So it's it's coming. There is going to be limitations on being able to get into places. And I'm pretty sure it's going to be happening throughout Caribbean jurisdictions in any place where tourism is heavy because they're going to have to mitigate those, you know, they're going to have to mitigate the ways in which we are able to spread it. Nothing is 100 percent. Even the vaccine isn't 100 percent. But if we layer approaches and layer safety protocols, then we can get that down to a very, very low, you know, and the vaccine is key to that. And people who don't have the vaccine um, following certain regulations is probably going to be a key part of it as well. Thank you, Eden. Um, we're actually running out of time now because um, this, the, although the internet is free, radio time isn't. And Brother Dawn has other, other things to do. So we are going to pick up um, where we left off next month if not before, but um, I want to thank, on behalf of the people of Bermuda, I want to thank both of you for taking time, not just the hour that we've been here, but the hours beforehand where, where, where we actually put in a lot of work behind the scenes. And I want to thank Ms. Smith Arch, Mrs. Smith, Smith Archer for coming up with the brilliant idea of having us on StreamYard. I want to thank those, the persons that have been tuning in, whether in Bermuda, or the Virgin Islands, or those that are listening via um, StreamYard and Facebook. Thank you for your questions. We are trying to make this a regular monthly show. So tune in until the next um, announcement of the next show. It may not necessarily have to be via ear. We can do it online at any time. Mm -hmm. And because we can get guests from other islands to, to talk about these things. So I will, um, any closing remarks, um, um, Ms. Mrs. Smith Archer? Well, just to say thanks again, Chris, for this opportunity to participate in the conversation. Um, glad to have met Eden. And, you know, I definitely love that acronym about RASCAL. I have to bring that over to the Virgin Islands <laughs> and create some RASCAL. But definitely let's keep this going. Uh, I, I think a lot of people are, you know, they're hungry to hear what's happening in our sister territories. And there are some very important, um, I think, topics or issues affecting all of us. So it, it's good to have the camaraderie and we feel that it's not just us out there. So looking forward to the next time um, to be here and, and having territory talk. All right. And Eden, and any, any closing remarks for the people of the, um, of the overseas territories? Uh, thank you so much for having me on here. It's, it is in vital that we make connections as Caribbean people. And I know that we didn't get around to to talking about the, uh, all the other topics, but again, we have many, many shows, obviously, to, to <laughs> do together. Um, and then I, I got a t-shirt to, for you already, Shana, so. <laughs> we can we get the rascal recruiting going all the way around uh, around the Caribbean, that's for sure. So uh, really great to, to connect, and let's be one as Caribbean people. Let's learn about each other appreciate each other support each other and make this region as strong as it is beautiful because we are just a beautiful people and and, and we need to look out for one another
Okay. And because we had the pleasure of StreamYard, we can actually have this show online sometime later on today, right, Ms. Mrs. Smith Archer? Sure, anytime. Sure, anytime. Okay. And before I go, as I said, there was a hint of nepotism. Um, this is the power of the internet. Uh, a few years ago, last year, I want to say, I was invited to be on a, a radio show in the Virgin Islands um, via, via the internet. And um, we, there were a number of, of us from different territories. And there was a young lady who was representing the Virgin Islands. And um, you know, she's very articulate. Um, extremely articulate, I should say. And last month, I was invited by another lady, Miss Potter, Melissa Potter, to um, speak to a group um, via via Zoom in the Virgin Islands about another situation that we'll get into another day. And there was this lady, and she said, "Hey, do you remember me?" And I'm like, uh, "Yeah, yeah, you were on that radio show." And long story short, a couple of days later, the lady says. What did that lady say? I think we're cousins. <laughs> she said, really? And we said, how are we cousins? And she said, my mom is blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, oh, let's see. That's who my mom's family is as well. The Frasers and the Thomases of mm -hmm. the Virgin Islands. Carrot yeah. Bay, Zion Hill, Seacoast mm -hmm. Bay. So yep. let me proudly introduce my cousin, <laughs> blood cousin, double cousin actually, probably triple yeah. cousin because we know how things go in the <laughs> islands. Shana Smith Archer, formerly uh, her mom is Mrs. Your mom is. So my mom is Belviana so Fraser is Smith, Belviana and Fraser her Smith. mother, so my grandmother right. is healing out of Pleasant Valley, Seacoast Bay area. Right. And my mom is June Fraser Thomas. So we are family. So we have to wrap up. And thank you. Love you all. Whether Bermuda, Cayman Islands, Virgin Islands, or whatever island, we love you all. And we'll talk yes. again soon. All right. Bye-bye. Brother Dawn, thank you. Thank you, sir. All right.